but um, you can hear my voice quite well uh, in the back as well. I'm sorry, I, I come up with the flu this morning, literally woke up with my head full of snot, uh, and um, I'm, I've doped up an ibuprofen talking to you today. So let's hope, uh, hope um, you know, you can understand that if my voice disappears during the talk, apologies in advance. So my name is Ilkka Turunen, um, and um, I'm a solutions architect for a company called Sonotype. So uh, in my job, I work with a lot of different companies across the world, especially here in EMEA and, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, Asia, helping them uh, look at their software development pipelines and uh, introduce what we call software supply chain principles into there. Today's talk really for me is about bringing, uh, uh, bringing kind of like the top tips of what we see in the trenches and really show you what can be done in order to facilitate security as a part of the software development process instead of, um, instead of um, actually being something that halts the process. So um, my background isn't security and I would never have characterized myself as a security guy. So just to kind of get over with the uh, credibility slide, um, uh, and, and, and the credibility aspect of uh, who I am. Um, I've done many different things. I've uh, run my own startup for a while uh, that was developing products in uh, application lifecycle management. We did some interesting meta distributions of, uh, of um, Debian and Ubuntu Linux in terms of um, kind of a pick it your own tool set. Um, I've worked as a CI, CD pipeline uh, consultant for, for a number of years in uh, London, helping some companies, large and small, the uh, largest being a Fortune 10 company with a massive office in a, in a really, really financial part of London, helping, helping them figure out how they're going to tackle this sort of cloud computing type of thing that was really new to them last year. Everybody else has been talking about it for quite some while. And um, finally, um, recently, I've been working with Sonotype to uh, really help uh, they help them uh, help them help customers figure out how to um, introduce uh, continuous delivery and how to think about software uh, supply chains as a part of it. One thing I've never, like I said, one thing I'd never call myself would really be a security guy. So I. I Definitely, I'm not a security professional, as some of you probably guys are probably much more into it. So one of the things that I wanted to do in order to kind of prove the point is I wanted to have a practical demo of a CVE that was released last year in order to kind of start this, uh, to start this talk off. How many of you recognize that code? Not very many. Good, good, good. So it's, it's quite simple. CVE, uh, that particular CVE has to deal with uh, something we call Jenkins. Jenkins, as we know, is a commonly used uh, CI and CD pipeline. Here's seen, here's seen uh, chugging along nicely in my, in my application. But this isn't uh, it's chugging along in my uh, software development environment. I've got some builds running here, and uh, let's imagine my imaginary company is chugging along nicely. Well, what happened last year uh, in the end of November, some of you might have seen this, was that there was a company called Foxglove Security that came out with a, with a, um, a interesting exploit that allowed uh, people to com compromise a lot of different applications, Jenkins being one of them. Now, to demonstrate you how complicated this uh, vulnerability exploit is, it's here. It's 41 lines, well, you can't really see it. It's, uh, the resolution isn't exactly stellar, is it? But um, um, it's 41 lines of code. So here we go, 41 lines of code. Now what we can do with this is we can basically take this code and send a, a, a payload to Jenkins. And what we can do is, um, uh, what, uh, what we can do is basically take uh, that 40 lines of code pointed to the server that's running on my uh, running on my local machine right here and send a payload that does something. Well, it uses uh, something called the remote CLI capability within Jenkins in order to send a piece of malicious code and what that does is simply allows me to write a file in my temp directory here seen under the pwned uh, text. So, uh, as you can see, not a very complicated uh, exploit uh, to leverage at all, and even someone like myself who hasn't got a background in security 
at all could take this line of code and learn how to use it within, uh, within about uh, five minutes of uh, figuring it out. And this is something that's publicly available on the internet, went around everybody's inboxes last year, and is, is very, very readily available for use. Well, to the, to the um, uh, accommodation of the Jenkins project itself, they released the mitigation on the day this article went out. So on that very day when this exploit that came out, uh, or this vulnerability came out for this particular part of the Jenkins functionality, their CTO themselves uh, himself committed a patch uh, into uh, their version control system that you can publicly look at uh, GitHub. Um, they uh, released a, um, a fixed version a few days later with a workaround, uh, workaround being circulated to all customers on the day, right? So this much you guys probably already know, you know, this isn't something that is new or, or anything special in, in the world of security. You know, exploits like this come all the time and, and, and uh, uh, occurrences of these exploits happen uh, at any given point. So this much you guys probably already know, you know, from the back of your hands and from the bottom of your hearts. It's probably like preaching to the crowd, choir, right? So what's interesting here is that um, I then asked the question, okay, well, obviously, you know, we're half, half a year in now. We're, um, you know, half a year later, everything should be peachy. Everybody should be running on a patched version right now uh, of this, uh, of this uh, service because Jenkins obviously is quite a popular uh, open source tool to use in order to facilitate continuous integration. So I went to somewhere called Sodan. Sodan is a search engine on the internet that, allow, that was originally actually developed to allow um, developers to search for open, um, open um, Internet of Things uh, applications. And what I just did there was I went in and I asked how, how many Jenkins instances can I find on the Internet running on the default port, uh, publicly available without any firewalling? And the answer to that, this is a dashboard of that search, is, again, you're not seeing very much. Here we go. The answer to that was uh, in that you know five minute five minute uh, Google that I did uh, using this sort of search engine, I managed to find 13,000 uh, 13, different running Jenkins instances on the internet. Well, you know, no big deal. I mean, obviously, they might be running on the public internet without a, you know some of them without any access control, but that doesn't mean that um, they haven't been patched, right? That doesn't mean that they haven't been fixed in this version. Well, I took an export of that data. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you can only take it in chunks of 10,000, otherwise it will start costing you. So I looked at the first 10,000 series uh, of those 13,000. And what I found out, basically, to um, uh, conclude this, um, uh, conclude this um, uh, numbers, is that 32%, 33% of those particular uh, servers had not yet been patched, so 33% of the publicly available service had not had that patch. So the question becomes, uh, why is it that after six months of you know, perfectly clear messaging, perfectly clear advisories, haven't these sorts of issues been patched? Now this isn't necessarily uniquely a, a Jenkins issue either. It's just something that's a very easy, easy and tangible example to illustrate uh, this sort of vulnerability. Well, the question is, why are those uh, one, third, uh, one third of these uh, instances still being left unpatched? And, and second of all, what is the real cause of this issue? Well, that's where my, unique, uh, my company's unique uh, point of view actually comes in uh, into play. So this vulnerability, this exploit, so easily run and so easily you know, allowing me to you know, write files on a file system is actually a, a, a cause by a third party component that is used as a dependency in the Jenkins application. It does not come from their own code at all. In fact, it is caused by a library called Commons Collections, which is a part of their dependency chain inside of their own, uh, inside of their um, own dependency management code chain. So uh, this Commons Collections uh, component, uh, was, this article was titled like this because uh, this component was found in all of these different applications. Um, and this actually is a surprisingly large, uh, large uh, issuer and cause of, uh, of uh, vulnerabilities and of uh, uh, exploits in applications. So these third, parties, uh, third party components actually comprise a surprisingly large amount 
of the code base of your final application. My company did a little bit of analysis on something called the Maven Central Repository. The Maven Central Repository is the largest collection of uh, open source components that is uh, available, uh, available on the internet. It has about 1. million different components that uh, developers can download in order to um, use uh, as a part of their software delivery or software construction process. And what we did was we asked some of the users there to uh, analyze their applications and tell us how many components did actually end up in a final compiled application. And the final numbers were an average application, an average enterprise application uh, from an end of about uh, 2,100. Uh, there is a link to the report where you can see these numbers at the, at the end of this had about 106 uh, unique components built in into there. And out of these 106 unique components, 24 had some sort of known vulnerability associated into it. Also, there aren't just evil hackers out there to you know, get companies. There were also some restricted licenses. So we then asked the, asked the question, you know, what does the average download cycle of uh, of a Maven Central user look like. So when a company downloads components from this massive open source library in order to build their applications, Maven being you know, the most used build tool in, in the Java world, uh, we came up to the numbers that said that the average customer will end up downloading about 240,000 components a year. So the average company will end up downloading about 240,000 components a year, and out of those 240K, about 15,000 of them contain some sort of known vulnerability inside of them. Uh, that adds up to about 6%. And now, that means that in every application that gets uh, sorted, some sort of a known vulnerability that gets compiled, some sort of known vulnerability is already bundled in there, 6% of the time. But what's really, really scary in this number is that um, out of all of the vulnerabilities that were downloaded, so these 1,500,000 uh, vulnerable components, about, uh, about half of them, over just over a half of them, ha had a vulnerability that was older than two years. So that vulnerability was actually disclosed over two years ago uh, that got bundled into that application. So the question is, why are we allowing these sorts of things to uh, go in, into our applications? And why are we allowing uh, these sorts of things to be downloaded? I mean, obviously, no one downloads this because they want to download these uh, bad components or bad vulnerabilities. So why are they still making their way into there? Well, one explanation is that if we look at the vulnerabilities in the, C in the uh, MITRE database, the CVE database, where, where we put all of these things, uh, that uh, Jenkins vulnerability was disclosed there uh, in November 2015 as a part of the as a part of the Commons Collections uh, exploits uh, that themselves were you know published in AppSec California uh, earlier on. Uh, it turns out that for every one vulnerability that gets a lot of publicity and gets the industry moving and actually patching issues and patching things, there were about 62 other critical vulnerabilities. So meaning CVSS score of seven or higher up until nine or uh, and 19 critical vulnerabilities that were also uh, disclosed in the uh, MITRE database. So not only did we uh, discover, uh, did we discover um, a single vulnerability, there were actually uh, 81 other vulnerabilities that were also discovered at the very same time uh, of equal or, or more severe exploitability. And yet we don't hear about these. So one of the, one of the explanations here is, is also, when it doesn't, I mean, obviously you guys know, but when it doesn't have a logo and a you know, nice website with a bleeding heart, uh, it very often omits our attention. And you know, that creates a false sense of security. And that doesn't mean they aren't, aren't there. And if we look at um, the Verizon Data Beach report from 2015, we've actually found out that um, uh, 10 CVEs amounted to 97% of all of the known attacks to, uh, uh, known attacks to Verizon in 2014. And if you look at the number CVE codes here, the oldest one of them is 1999, and most of them are, you know, come from some, uh, somewhere in early noughties. So in 2014, all of the known web attacks, 97% uh, of them were done with 10-year-old or older exploits that were publicly available on the internet, publicly accessible, and completely publicly sourceable uh, into the applications. So question is, uh, why is it that even though 
we should be aware of, this, uh, of these vulnerabilities and we obviously should be aware of how to mitigate these vulnerabilities. We obviously aren't, right? Most of these are Microsoft related, uh, Microsoft and Windows related problems, but uh, one of them is Poodle. So Poodle, for example, was exploited very, very much. And it, it isn't uniquely an application level problem either. So when we look at, um, when we look at um, uh, applications, uh, these problems obviously do exist, but uh, there was another company called Banyanops that did some research uh, about Docker containers. They looked at the Docker Hub and looked at all of the containers hosted in there and asked how many of them have, you know, no, some sort of known security vulnerability. And they found out that out of all of the containers in uh, uh, over when they did their analysis last year, 36% uh, of them had a high known security vulnerability built into there. Well, okay, fair enough. Not all containers there are, you know, even updated anymore. They're just retained, uh, retained for backwards compatibility purposes. So if we just look at the containers that were published in 2015 alone, we still found out that 40% uh, of those containers contain some sort of known high vulnerability. Um, finally, uh, what we saw, even if you look at just the latest images that were published into that Docker Hub, we found out that 23% of them had some sort of known high vulnerability. So the, the conclusion here is that this uh, problem exists across the entire spectrum of the software development lifecycle, not just in applications, but also in systems, and also in, uh, also in um, environments and even data centers. I call this compound risk. You know, I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently, about why is it that these sorts of risks get up, get, end up making themselves into their applications? And the answer is, because, uh, because of something called compound risks, right? So we use uh, some sort of quant of co reusable code, like jar files or whatever packages, in order to build our applications, right? We use those and we build and bundle them into specific applications. These applications then, you know, we bundle them together, we use some third party applications elsewhere, and we deploy them into some sort of containers and some sort of uh, other uh, other uh, uh, virtual machines or contain Docker containers or whatever that then run those environments. And those containers then get provisioned and become information systems. Now the problem here is introducing a vulnerable bit, you know, especially when it comes from an external source at any given time of this process will end up compromising that entire chain. So if you have something that's faulty down here, um, it will end up actually destroying uh, or implicating, might end up implicating uh, this system here at the top. And the problem is build processes, bundling processes, and uh, provisioning processes tend to also not be very transparent about what is exactly being uh, bundled in into a final, uh, final application. So for example, if you run a, run a build or a dependency make, you will notice that um, a lot of them tend to actually have, um, tend to actually not uh, disclose the list of, for example, what sort of transitive dependencies ended up making there. Well, uh, I then asked myself how, you know, uh, there's a, a very old known wisdom in the industry that says, uh, you know, fixing things earlier uh, will make things better and will make fixing things faster, right? So fixing an issue, a, a, a vulnerability earlier on in the software development lifecycle uh, will be faster. So I looked at um, the Journal of Defense Software Engineering just find a find an estimate of how much uh, faster it is to fix an issue earlier on in the software development lifecycle. So if we find a problem when it's already gone into a live system, it can easily take 250 units of time in order for us to fix it. But if, you know, if we fix it earlier on in the development process, right here at the very early stages, it might only take one tenth of that time. But the question is, we're using quite a lot of open source now and uh, quite a lot of third party components in our applications. There are now 106 of these in every single application that we end up bundling in. So uh, what, the question is, it actually probably is even faster, in, uh, even faster to just block these bad things from coming in in the first place. So the very fastest thing that you can do in a, in a software development cycle is actually stop these from happening in the first place. So, you know, not accepting uh, you know, these bad components in the first place. This all sounds hopefully quite, you know, clear as day and probably, probably, all, uh, probably very, um, uh, uh, very, very blatantly obvious. But the question is, and it should be blatantly obvious. So the question is, how are we trying to prevent this from happening today then? Well, 
almost uh, uh, top 10 in the 2013 edition included for the first time the new point A9. A9 uh, or using components with known vulnerabilities. So even almost, uh, even almost uh, uh, recognized that this, this sort of vulnerabilities actually exist and publish some tooling in order to, uh, in order to fix it. And so this has been uh, out there for a long time and because that is used as a reference, many standards actually contain some sort of, um, some sort of uh, reference or guidance uh, to uh, uh, addressing this sort of issue. Like for example, PCI DSS has the requirement six PCI DSS being a standard used in the financial industry and payments industry that says uh, in order for you to be able to process payments, first of all, you have to establish a process to identify security vulnerabilities uh, by using a reputable outside source and then categorizing them. But most importantly, ensuring that all system components and software are protected from known vulnerabilities by installing applicable vendor supplied security patches. Well, it seems like we're not very good at uh, 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 following standards. There are also other standards like the IEC uh, standard here that deals with medical devices that um, also uh, say, st says that uh, when we're using software of unknown pedigrees or components of unknown pedigree, things that we haven't necessarily written ourselves or things that have been shared by others, we have to establish processes in order to follow these sorts of things. But too often in my experience from the development side, it ends up, uh, ends up working out something like this. So this is a PCI DSS requirement checklist uh, that uh, you know, is an Excel sheet, a worksheet that allows me to um, you know, check boxes off and check risks off um, uh, from, uh, from uh, my applications. The problem with this is um, too often from a development point of view, uh, this becomes more of a checkbox exercise than an actual uh, actionable item. So we kind of go around, we gather all the answers into this and we say, you know what, we're compliant now. But unfortunately, compliance is and security. And in this say, case, uh, you know, the road, the road is always kind of paved, uh, uh, paved with good intentions. So, you know, using, using this sort of checklist, kind of uh, pounding and scolding developers and then asking them, uh, would, are you compliant with this particular, uh, particular uh, piece of um, uh, legislation uh, can easily lead up, to the lead up to the outcome, in my experience, of the top three most critical items being checked off and everything else being addressed later on in the development life cycle, meaning maybe in five years' time, maybe in 15 years' time, maybe, you know, it's been since 1999, we still haven't quite checked that list, uh, uh, list item off from that. Now, uh, another way of uh, combating against, you know, these sort of third-party dependencies is uh, approving uh, components in bulk. So, you know, uh, run, running some sort of, you know, analysis on every single component individually, and then uh, they're now saying, okay, that's good, that's bad, that's not okay. But as, a, as an organization grows, and as I'll later show in with a couple of calculations, this becomes an unstable and unscalable process. And finally, you know, some companies I've seen have actually entirely deplugged from the internet and said, you know what, we will not allow anyone to download anything. We will write everything either in-house or we will uh, only, you know, through careful consideration, bulk approve things that you can use to build your applications. And this unfortunately isn't things that you can do today if you're trying to, you know, work in a continuous delivery or continuous integration fashion because that just means that you're hindering the development process from happening. If you're trying to aim for 100 releases a day, this certainly isn't uh, the way to go. So what can we do in order to facilitate, you know, facilitate these things as a part of the software development process instead of actually working against it? What can we do in order to uh, facilitate this sort of actions happening? Well, I would like to introduce you to the concept of supply chains. There's a supply chain is a concept from the manufacturing industry that says that, for example, if we have a laptop, if we have a laptop, it might have, that laptop consists of many different parts that are used to assemble, right? You know, a laptop has a keyboard, has a screen, has an al aluminum body. Well, if you take the keyboard, that keyboard is made out of plastic. That plastic uh, comes in granule form, it's melted down and then formed into the keyboard that is then assembled on top of the electronics, probably assembled by some other party uh, onto my laptop. And that plastic granulate comes from crude oil that is drilled by some other company, to, uh, some other places. So all of these sort of actors uh, collaborate and work together in order to provide, uh, in order to create a, um, a piece of raw resource that we are using to build 
our uh, final product. And it, that supply chain doesn't actually end there. You know, after a laptop is complete, it goes to a computer wholesaler, goes to a computer store, and then finally to a customer that uh, buys it and uses it and, you know, puts it in here that I can then uh, use as a, as a part of my um, presentation uh, mechanism. So uh, this supply chain concept actually exists in the software uh, ecosystem equally, as we saw in the last, uh, last example. And we can actually leverage uh, advice from that very same industry uh, that, uh, in, a, in a very similar way. So there's a guy called W. Edwards Deming that uh, helped transform the, so the manufacturing industry of Japan in the 60s. Most notably, um, a, a little car company called Toyota that he helped transform using his uh, 14 principles of management into, into um, efficient uh, manufacture of cars that had an advantage that lasted for decades compared to competitors. And we've stolen a lot of these principles already in software. You know, lean and agile methodologies actually lean a lot, of, uh, lean a lot into his thinking. But there are two things that we still haven't quite stolen from him as an industry. First of all, he says, cease dependence on inspection to achieve quality. And secondly, move towards a single supplier uh, of, for any one item instead of, um, instead of our minimum on the buying on the basis of a price tag. So instead of, you know, just getting what seems to be the lowest uh, friction uh, friction um, uh, supplier, instead what we should do is we should seize dependence on, on these sorts of things. And finally, we shouldn't, you know, uh, do uh, uh, inspections uh, in order to achieve quality at the end of a process. We should actually build quality as a part of the manufacturing process. So we should facilitate uh, uh, quality so that it actually happens as a part of the uh, manufacturing process of, you know, cars or whatever, instead of, uh, you know, waiting until it is done, then stopping the process and looking at it and trying to fix it. And these have had some very, very tangible benefits. And this kind of supply chain logic actually works exactly the same in software, ma software manufacturing as well. We have supply chain managers in our software, but instead they're called dependency managers or, or build tools or whatever. In Java, for example, here's an example of how a Maven dependency looks like. Here's, a, here's an example of how RubyGems look like. And here's an example of how, n in the Node.js ecosystem, this similar type of mechanism uh, ends up working out. So dependency managers actually uh, do exactly the same function. They source some other dependencies that you then use to manufacture your software. And this supply chain is actually surprisingly complex within the, um, uh, within the um, uh, uh, software industry specifically. There is a concept known as transitive dependencies, meaning dependencies of your dependencies. That means, you know, the suppliers of your software also uh, use other suppliers to provide some functionality for their software. This little dust mite here in the space isn't actually just a you know, nice illustration. It's actually a visualization of all of the components that were housed in Maven Central uh, in the, in the uh, uh, middle of last year, if I remember correctly. Uh, and all of these white dots are those components. These orange lines are their interdependencies. So dependencies of other dependencies of other dependencies. So that supply chain of software quants gets into a massively complex point. So what can we then do in order to translate those same supply chain thing, that same supply chain thinking from the manufacturing industry into the software industry? Well, first of all, you have to control the amount and quality of your suppliers and the components that you use. Secondly, we have to standardize our component catalog. We have to standardize, uh, uh, standardize what we use instead of allowing every developer to choose their own you know, tools. It's kind of like going to a car mechanic that has a you know, car mechanic chain. Every shop just has a different set of tools inside of there. You know, instead, we should you know, come up with a standard toolkit in order to uh, uh, limit the amount of stuff that we're downloading. Third of all, in order uh, for us to then uh, chalk off those uh, you know, 10 uh, bad CVEs, we have to learn to leverage automated quality controls as a part of the continuous integration pipeline. Uh, and finally, uh, we have to maintain what is known uh, uh, in the uh, development industry as a bill of materials or a list of all of the components that go into an application and their underlying components. And of course, one thing to, one thing to also recognize here is that you have, this is, isn't something that you can just run with tooling. You have to actually take ownership and institute leadership within the development teams themselves in order for them to uh, start uh, using these things because, you know, just tossing things at people will not necessarily make them 
view thing. So let's look at each of these points really quickly and see what are some concrete actions that we can, we can do in order to, um, in order to uh, facilitate this. Well, first of all, uh, you have to control the amount and quality of your suppliers. So how can you do that? Well, first of all, you have to ask yourself a, a couple of quite deep questions about uh, what to look out for in a good supplier in the first place. You know, things like how often do they release? You know, if you, if you have a project that releases often versus a project that's released once in 10 years, that might give you a bit of an indication of uh, the quality of the team and the ecosystem behind it. And secondly, of course, we have to look at things like how popular is this project? You know, an Apache top-level project or a Novos project is probably more uh, trustworthy than something coming off straight out of GitHub. Of course, we have to look at what's internally popular, what's popular inside of our own, uh, inside of our own software uh, development uh, ecosystem, meaning our own developers, uh, in order to, you know, standardize what's already known. Finally, of course, we have to look at you know, things like security vulnerabilities, how, uh, how fast they're actually uh, fixed by those projects and suppliers, and of course, you know, loads of other aspects. But the key thing here is that tooling can help facilitate these sorts of things. Things like artifact repositories might actually be a very valuable tool for you to um, help take a glance and actually create an audit of what is, uh, what is, uh, what is present in your application. So if you look at... Uh, a, a basic uh, software delivery pipeline. You know, we've got some developers, we've got some SCM, build automation, a binary repository manager, deployment automation, and uh, some target environments. Uh, you know, a binary repository, what happens normally is a developer checks out some code from an SCM in order to start developing, and they also download some dependencies using these dependency managers. Using a binary repository between a third party uh, public repo uh, actually can help, uh, help Keep you, help you keep track and audit what is being downloaded. So that helps you stop, for example, the bad stuff coming in in order to, um, or at least have a glimpse. So are we using one of the you know, components that have these 10-year-old you know, uh, vulnerabilities that we've, we've been seeing? Well, and so it allows you to really, uh, it allows you to really um, uh, create a control point of, um, uh, of, um, um, uh, of these components. And another thing that it does, it actually helps you mitigate risk from that third party, that public repository going down. And there's a well-known example in the, in the um, uh, uh, MPM ecosystem where um, a, a Turkish developer got really angry at Node.js and the community and pulled about 273 of his own components outside of the MPM.js library. Well, what ended up happening was one of them was called LeftBad uh, that was relied widely upon, widely upon by the ecosystem uh, of, of MPM developers. And um, that component caused thousands of builds to fail within minutes of it being pulled out. Pretty, pretty scary stuff. Well, what kind of component is this? What kind of uh, component was so crucial that um, uh, it uh, caused all of these builds to fail, including the core of MPM itself? It was 11 lines of code that takes in a character, a string, and pad, and a number, and pads the string with the character for as many num times as you put the number. Right. So the guy pulled that out, and uh, all of these builds started failing because, uh, because this risk of that third-party uh, third uh, source was not seen as a, as a very, very large risk. But when it did happen, all of the, all of the um, uh, builds started failing because of this being missing. So not only does it help you catalog things, it actually helps you mitigate some risk from there on as well. Now, a second thing, of course, is to standardize this catalog. So what can we do in order to, um, uh, in order to make things better? Well, to refresh the stats, uh, you know, if we have 106 components of one application, no, very, very few companies just build one specific application. Uh, you know, uh, if, we, uh, if we multiply these numbers by themselves and we assume that, you know, uh, we also use more than one version of a single component, what well, we can actually see that um, the, the number of actually used components cascades very, very rapidly. So uh, standardization uh, is important. So we cannot allow, uh, we cannot make, we cannot let people, to, people use all of the available components out there, we have to let them, uh, we have to actually standardize and say, here is our toolkit. Here's our, here are the few different uh, components that we want to use in our specific application. 
And we have to be picky about them as well. We have to make sure that, you know, we use those same quality metrics that we spoke about in the last point and actually also then uh, extend that thinking into saying, should we re really allow five different authentication libraries across our company or should we just use one trusted version uh, or one trusted supplier in order to pr provide that uh, sort of um, that sort of functionality. So not only can that uh, piece of tooling act as a catalog and control point, it can now act as an audit trail as well and help developers make the decisions about their toolkit. Da, 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 da. Move away. And this is, for example, how that sort of standardization might look like. You might, for example, say that instead of using all of the available versions of JUnit as a part of building on applications, uh, we only want to use, for example, one specific thing. And we can actually write tests on it. We can actually write the normal tests that run and say, unless it's, in a, it's a component that we want, uh, we version that is approved, you shouldn't use it. And that gets me to the largest point of the day. Leverage automation uh, as a part of your exist and existing workflows as a part of security. There are many different frameworks of what should happen uh, uh, happen as a part of the, the development pipeline and what should happen as a part of a security process. This comes from an FSISAC report, so the Financial Security Information Security Association, that tells, uh, you know, a, 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 shows a singular model uh, of uh, software security as an assessment. And it says, for example, that, you know, you should run binary static scans, dynamic scans, pen testing, and web application testing. Uh, you can run all of this manually, but if you want to, you know, keep up with the pace of development, ideally, what you want to leverage is something that the developers do every single day. And like I already kind of spoiled my surprise, I would like to leverage, I, I call this the onion model of testing, right? Developers rely on testing heavily in order to ensure the quality of their software. They use uh, unit testing uh, to test uh, functions, uh, integration testing to test other bits, and functional testing to test uh, other components as well we have to actually start including security and governance as a part of this standard test suite, those very same tests that developers already run day to day uh, as a part of their software development pipeline, we have to start including security aspects of there. Security has such a wonderful tool set like Metasploit or other things that can already be leveraged and exploited as a part of this. And from a third party dependency point of view, we can actually make them run as exactly like normal tests. So here I have a failed Maven build that is failed because um, there, is a poly there is a test that fails because um, a commons file upload has a known security vulnerability. So you cannot even run your build because a security vulnerability already exists. This is much faster feedback for the developer than, um, than um, uh, just you know, waiting until the system is already being deployed. We can run these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of tests very, very easily as a part of you know, every, every sort of um, uh, continuous integration pipeline. There is still need for more slower human-led analysis as well. You know, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't you know, do things, uh, things uh, at, at various different times. But what it really means is that we need to find a place for these sorts of uh, easy coverage types of tests, these sorts of synchronous tests uh, that I call them, that give you just enough information in order to action it as a part of your development and then run deeper, deeper dive analysis uh, outside of the development process. But already, by doing these sort of basic tests where you, know, where, where you ensure that you know, all of these kind of basic CVEs are out, you're mitigating a lot of risk and a lot of security problems in the first place. So this can give rise to what I call the rugged software factory. Meaning, not all, we can leverage the very same tools that already existed there in order to then leverage that build stage to run, you know, these uh, uh, dependency analyses or these kind of uh, on-the-go quick checks of, of what's happening with the third-party components and then uh, run a larger uh, static analysis later on in the, uh, uh, in the uh, delivery cycle. And what that gives us is early feedback uh, about these things uh, allows us to give a control point that is within our control and allow, doesn't allow developers to, you know, put on a hotspot and uh, subvert uh, subvert some of the me measures that you've done or doesn't allow them to just tick a box in the checklist, but actually some, that is something that is within your control and finally gives you trusted objects that you can then deploy. The final thing I'm mentioning today is the bill of materials, uh, which is a, a list of all of the components that go into your application. And the very simple reason why you want this is because one of the most common ways of facilitating security, especially in companies that don't have a security person, is that these articles get forwarded, uh, sent up, you know, one guy sees it, 
sends it to his colleague, that gets forwarded to another guy, that gets forwarded to his boss, gets forwarded to the CTO, and suddenly the entire company is scrambling to reverse engineer everything they've ever deployed for over the 10 years to figure out if something is actually in production. Instead, you should collate, if you're already testing for these dependencies, you should collate uh, a bill of materials, a list of ingredients that went in into building that specific release. What were the components that we used in order to build that release? Because car manufacturers, when they, when they pull out a car uh, out of the factory, that car has a list of ingredients so that if one of the components fails, then uh, in that case, uh, that case um, you know, they can issue a pullback instead of you know, reverse engineering every shipped car out, in, out there in the field. So ask yourself, do you want to do a manual, a manual reverse engineering operation, or do you just want a database to search against? I think it's quite a simple answer, really, isn't it? Um, and finally, uh, in order, one final thing that I want to do, because we're running out of time, is that um, leadership is important. To me, as a developer, the security guy has always been this guy. It's been that troll under the bridge that sits just, uh, just on the bridge to um, you know, the uh, uh, green future in, in, in tomorrow that I want to, um, that I, where I want to ship my application, comes from around the bridge and says, P54, you gotta, you gotta uh, do a pen test, bro, uh, before, before it's actually allowed there. Like I said, instead of uh, working against the development teams, we should, uh, uh, one of the greatest ways of instigating leadership and, and understanding of security is actually to build knowledge in terms that the developers and the operators understand. In my case, the most effective thing I've ever seen is including it as a part of their everyday testing cycle, making sure that the security enables and doesn't block the process. The, final, the assertion uh, that I'm making is that, you know, if you look at historically about how different functions in software development have gone, testing has become test-driven development. We are now writing tests in order to develop code. Usability testing, you know, clicking on the user interface has become behavioral given development. We have cucumber tests, we have other tests that allow us to, uh, allow us to um, uh, run uh, usability and user interface testing automatically. Integration testing, running a system in a production-like environment, has become model-driven development with, uh, by leveraging things like, uh, things like Chef or Puppet or other configuration management tools. And now, in fact, probably container-based development because we can now have a unified environment across all of the targets. So QED, in, in this sort of way, security has to become a part of the development. We have to start facilitating security-driven development. Write tests first, test against for every build, and then ship if tests are compliant. And also, you know, be transparent with knowledge. So in conclusion, you know, if you do use tools in the right way, what you can facilitate is a software, rugged software factory that can, uh, that can facilitate these sorts of things, that can really help you make the security as a part of that process make the developers actually ship faster, not slower, because of security considerations, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have these five things. They have loads of benefits. And really, if you look at the aspects of security, these can be choked off very, very nicely uh, by uh, using uh, these sorts of methods of way. And finally, for change, doing the right thing is actually also doing the cheapest thing. You know, do, mitigating problems earlier on and allowing the developers to issue fixes to their own code helps them uh, fix uh, problems, uh, uh, helps them fix problems faster and also cheaper because, you know, less time in development, uh, less time remediating issues and less time creating value is less time, you know, generating revenue. That's it. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Uh, I hope you got something out of, uh, out of it, uh, out of there. So here are all of my references. You'll see them in in the um, slide deck that will be shared later on as well. Do have a read of all of the reports because they're very interesting data. Thanks. That's a very, very, very good question. The question was, um, uh, if I have a multiple language environment, how do we scale this up? So how can we scale this, uh, 
this sort of way of working not to just only apply to one single piece of the puzzle, but uh, also to other places. That, that's essentially what we were asking. The answer is there are vendors out there, I might work for one, but um, there are vendors out there that do supply um, uh, uh, products that actually contain support for more than just one language. So ideally what you want to think about is actually more of a, more of a um, system that can support many of these things. I mean, each, of, each uh, vendor, my, each uh, programming language, for example, and su supplier and system do have their own artifact repositories. So you might just want to look at, you know, having, you know, one of those, one of each. But there are also combination solutions that allow you to actually aggregate all of them into one single server. Uh, in my experience, that's more effective, you know, in my practitioner experience as well, is, you know, do you want to manage 15 different servers for 15 different languages or just one? Does that answer the question? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.